In this lecture, you'll learn about how SAN is implemented in ONTAP. I'll talk about the similarities and the differences between iSCSI and Fibre Channel and FCOE. I'm not going to get into NVMe OF yet because I'm going to cover that in a couple of dedicated lectures later in this section. A very quick bit of review first, just to make sure we're all on the same page with the terminology. A LUN is a logical unit number. That is a logical representation of a disk. And LUNs are specific to SAN protocols. So when you're configuring SIFS, SMB or NFS, you don't have LUNs. When you configure any of the SAN protocols, you always have LUNs. The LUN is presented from the target to the initiator, which gets block level access, the same as if it was a hard drive installed in the chassis of that client. The client is the initiator and the storage is the target. The LUN in ONTAP goes in either a volume or into a Q3. And volumes containing LUNs do not need to be junctioned to the SVM namespace in order to serve SAN data. They only require an I group to LUN mapping, which is how we do the LUN masking in ONTAP. So you saw in the last section about the NAS protocols. Whenever we're configuring NAS, the volume has to be mounted into the namespace of the SVM. And say if we've got a volume, which is volume one, and then we mount volume two underneath there, then if a client maps a drive to volume one, they will see volume two as a directory inside volume one. And if we have any Q trees in the namespace, they will show up as directories inside the volumes as well. So with our NAS protocols, the namespace is basically the directory structure and it's built by creating the junctions for the volumes and for the Q trees. And the clients will see that directory structure and they can browse through it. It's different with the SAN protocols. With the SAN protocols, you create a LUN for the client, the client connects to the LUN, and then it is the client which has got control of that LUN. With your NAS protocols, it's the storage system, which is controlling the file system. With your SAN protocols, the client gets block level access and it is controlling the file system. So it's not like you have a different directory structure built up of your volumes and your Q trees as you do with NAS. You don't have that with SAN. The client just gets direct access to the LUN and it's going to be controlling it and it's going to be building any kind of directory structure inside there itself. Okay, looking at iSCSI first and having a look at the configuration steps. So I'll just give you a summary here. In a later lecture in the section, we're going to actually do this with a lab demo. So when you're configuring iSCSI, first off, enable an SVM for iSCSI. So create the SVM and enable the iSCSI protocol on there. Next, create your aggregates, if you don't have them already, your volumes, and optionally Q trees to host the LUNs. Then create your iSCSI logical interfaces, then go on to the client, onto the initiator. So those first three steps that you see there in blue, they're configured on the ONTAP system. Once that's done, you go on to the initiator, for example, a Windows or a Linux client, and from there, you're going to discover the target from the initiator. So from the client, you discover the storage system. Then create sessions to the target from the initiator. Then back on the ONTAP system again, you configure LUN masking with an initiator group. So in ONTAP, the terminology for the way that LUN masking is enabled is with an initiator group, which is usually just called an I group. Next, create a LUN on the storage system, which is the virtual disk for the client, and then map the LUN to the I group to tie them together. Finally, connect to the LUN from the client and configure it for use, meaning format it. Okay, so some details about iSCSI. 
the IQN is the iSCSI qualified name, and that identifies the SVM as a whole. Remember, in ONTAP, every separate SVM appears as a separate storage system to clients. So if you've got two different iSCSI SVMs, they're going to look like two different storage systems, and they'll each have their own separate IQN. Individual ports are identified by IP address. And IP addresses are not applied directly to physical ports, they're applied to our logical interfaces. That's exactly the same as it worked with our NAS protocols. And again, the same as NAS, multiple lifts can share the same underlying physical port. For fiber channel, initiator access through the SAN is secured through zoning on the switches. But Ethernet switches used for iSCSI do not support zoning, so we can't do that. So the way that we'll usually secure the client access with iSCSI is through CHAP authentication. Do that between the initiator and the target. With one-way CHAP, only the target authenticates the initiator. So the storage system is going to check that this is a valid client. With mutual CHAP, that's two-way. The initiator will also authenticate the target. Okay, so that was some details about iSCSI there. You'll see more when we get into the actual iSCSI configuration coming up soon. Next up, let's have a look at Fiber Channel and Fiber Channel over Ethernet, FCOE. So both Fiber Channel and FCOE use FCP, the Fiber Channel protocol. They both work exactly the same way. FCOE is Fiber Channel. It's just encapsulated in an Ethernet header to allow it to run over Ethernet networks. Because of that, there's no separate configuration for Fiber Channel and FCOE on ONTAP systems. They're both configured as Fiber Channel. They both use WWPNs for the addressing on the initiators and the targets. So they both use the same fabric login process, except they both work exactly the same way. The only difference is FCOE is on Ethernet ports, Fiber Channel is on native Fiber Channel ports. They're both using WWPNs for the addressing. The WWPNs are assigned to Fiber Channel logical interfaces, just like we have IP addresses assigned to our logical interfaces for our NAS protocols and for iSCSI. Fiber Channel lifts are homed on UTA2 ports configured as either native Fiber Channel, if you're using native Fiber Channel, or CNA, Converged Network Adapter, for FCOE. And if you configure a UTA port as a CNA, it can also be used for NAS or iSCSI. Because when you configure it for CNA, you're configuring it as an Ethernet rather than as a fiber channel port. But that Ethernet port does also have support for FCOE as well as for iSCSI and the NAS protocols. So looking at our configuration steps for fiber channel and FCOE, they're both configured exactly the same way because ONTAP really sees them basically as the same. So first up, we configure our UTA2 adapters as either type fiber channel or as type CNA. We then create the SVM and enable fiber channel on there. We then create our aggregates, if we don't have them already, our volumes and optionally Q3s to host the LUNs. We then create our fiber channel logical interfaces with the WWPNs on there. Next, we configure LUN masking with an initiator group. So everything you see there, it's pretty much exactly the same as how we configured iSCSI. So the configuration for iSCSI and the configuration for Fiber Channel is very, very similar. And that's why I wanted you to see this in the same video for both of them. Again, the text in blue is on the ONTAP storage system. So all of those steps were on the storage side. Next thing we do is configure zoning on the fiber channel switches. So you could have done that before the LUN masking, but you need to have the fiber channel lifts created first so that you know the WWPNs to include in the LUN masking information and also in the zoning information on your switches. Next, create a LUN on the storage system. Then map the LUN to the I group to tie them together and make sure it's only the specific host that you want to that is able to connect to the LUN. And then finally, configure the LUN for use on the host. 
Now, you saw there that the configuration is nearly identical for iSCSI and for Fiber Channel. The differences are that for iSCSI, you don't need to configure zoning on the switches because the switches don't support it. And the other difference is in Fiber Channel, there's no need for the initiator to discover the target like we did in iSCSI because that is handled by the Fiber Channel fabric login process. But other than that, the configuration is exactly the same. So if you can configure iSCSI, you can configure Fiber Channel as well. Some more details about Fiber Channel. The WWNN is a worldwide node name, and that identifies the SVM as a whole. So that's the equivalent to the IQN that we had in iSCSI. Individual ports, however, are identified by the WWPN. That's a worldwide port name. And the WWPNs that are in use are not applied directly to the physical ports. They are applied to the LIF logical interfaces. So if you've got a logical interface that's being used for a NAS protocol or for iSCSI, it's going to have an IP address on there. If you've got a logical interface that's being used for Fiber Channel or FCOE, then it's going to use a WWPN. And again, multiple LIFs can share the same underlying physical port. That's why we have those logical interfaces to allow us to do that. So we have a WWPN on the logical interface. We also have WWPNs on the underlying physical ports as well. The physical port WWPNs begin with 50. They do not present a target service, so clients cannot connect in on those WWPNs. Therefore, they should not be included in any zone configurations on your switches even though they will still show up as logged into the fabric. So if you go on to your fiber channel switch and you put in the show command there to see all of the WWPNs that are connected, you will see both the physical WWPNs beginning with 50 and you'll also see the logical WWPNs on the lifts beginning with 20. They will show up there as well. And the WWPN that you need to include in your zoning configuration, the WWPN that the initiators are actually going to be connecting on is the WWPNs on the lifts, and they start with 20. The command at the command line to see the WWPNs on the physical ports is FCP adapter show. The command to see the WWPNs on the lifts is network interface show. You can also see this in System Manager as well. So you can see in the screenshot here, we've gone to Network and then to FC, FCOE and NVMe adapters. And there we can see the physical ports and we can see the WWPNs on those physical ports, which all begin with 50. If we go to the network menu and then network interfaces, we'll see the logical interfaces. So in here, you will see all of your Ethernet logical interfaces and you'll see your fiber channel logical interfaces as well. So you can see actually down at the bottom there, you can see some of our Ethernet logical interfaces with IP addresses on there. And up at the top here, we have got our fiber channel logical interfaces with a WWPN, and you can see that all these lifts begin with 20. This is the ones that the initiators connect into. Okay, next thing is NPIV, which is Endport ID Virtualization. That is a technology that can be used on your switches. This allows the fiber channel or FCU switch to accept multiple WWPNs on the same physical switch port. And NPIV must be enabled on your fiber channel switches when you're using ONTAP because ONTAP uses those logical interfaces and multiple WWPNs are going to be reported to the same physical port. We've got the physical WWPN. We've also got the logical WWPN as well. They're going to be coming in on the same port and we can have multiple lifts on the same underlying physical port as well. So for the fiber channel switch to support that, you need to enable NPIV on it. Okay, let's talk about some of the details about our SAN logical interfaces. So as you know already, our NAS logical interfaces support either NFS or SIFS or both. So you can have both NFS and SIFS clients connecting in on the same IP addresses. Our SAN logical interfaces support either Fiber Channel and FCOE 
or iSCSI. Obviously, they don't support both because fiber channel lifts use WWPNs, iSCSI lifts use IP addresses. Your SAN logical interfaces do not support NAS. So on a NAS lift, it can support both NFS and SIFS, but it can't run iSCSI on there. iSCSI is just for iSCSI. You can't run NAS on it as well. And that's because our NAS lifts and our SAN lifts work differently for the failover. FCOE and iSCSI lifts can, however, share underlying physical interfaces with NAS lifts. So you could have, for example, an iSCSI lift with IP address 10.10.10.10 on there, and it could be on the physical port of E0A, and then you could also have a NAS lift being used for NFS with IP address 10.10.10.20, and it could be on the same underlying physical port. So at the physical port level, they support both SAN and NAS, but at the lift level, it's one or the other. Still talking about our SAN lifts, they are assigned a home node and a home port. So a normal underlying physical port where they normally live, that's the same as for our NAS lifts, but a difference is that SAN lifts do not fail over. Remember we spoke about this before when we spoke about the failover for the NAS lifts. From a client's point of view, if it's a NAS client, SIFS or NFS, when it connects to its storage system, it's connecting to a single IP address. It only knows about that one IP address. So if the path to that IP address goes down, then the storage system needs to fail it over to a different port so that the client can still get to that same IP address. With our SAN lifts, it's different though. The client doesn't just know about one lift and one IP address. The client will learn about all of the different SAN lifts. So it knows about the different paths to get there and it knows about the different IP addresses or WWPNs. So because the client knows about all the different paths and the different targets, it can fail over itself if the path goes down. So there's no need for a SAN lift to fail over to a different port. So SAN lifts do not fail over, NAS lifts do. Our SAN lifts can, however, be moved to a different port or node within the SVM manually by you, the administrator, if you want to do that. To do that, you need to take the lift offline first. Just the lift, you don't need to do it to the physical port. So if you've got a physical port with multiple lifts on there and you just want to move this one lift, just take that one lift online and then move it. All the other lifts on the physical port will still remain operational while you're doing that. Our SAN lifts also can be grouped into port sets to control which clients can connect on which ports. I'll talk about that a bit more in the next lecture. Some best practice for our lunch. Your LUNs can be created either in volumes or in queue trees that are in volumes. Each LUN will typically be created in one of two ways. Either the LUN is in its own dedicated volume. So you, for each LUN, you've got a separate volume and there's nothing else in those volumes. So for example, you've got a LUN 1 volume and a LUN 2 volume and a LUN 3 volume and so on. Or the other way you can do it is you can have multiple LUNs in dedicated queue trees within the same volume. So this way, we would have a volume called LUN volume, for example. And in there, we would have a queue tree called LUN1, a queue tree called LUN2, a queue tree called LUN3, etc. So you can do it either way, but you don't want to do it any other way than that. So a dedicated volume or a dedicated queue tree for each one. And last thing, do not create LUNs in the data SVM root volume. You should not have any data at all ever in your SVM root volumes of either NAS or SAN. And for consistent snapshot copies, NetApp recommends using SnapDrive or Snap Manager. If you're doing that, turn off volume level snapshots in that case. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.